Welcome everyone to a special debate hosted by We Are Libertarians Network. I am your moderator, Hody Johns, and I'm excited to bring you some very bright minds today. Today we'll be discussing abortion. I am joined by debaters Sarah Brady Wagner and Dennis Allen Miller II, who have graciously agreed to share their opposing viewpoints on the topic. Abortion is a complex issue. If you think it's simple, then you're living in an echo chamber and you should prepare to hear intelligent people talk about both sides and a lot of knowledge. Remember that the winner of the debate is not the one who you agreed with the most. It's the one who made you think the most. Both of these individuals have done a great amount of research and thinking about the topic, and the fact that they have come to different conclusions means that we should be open to all information on the issue. I ask the audience to be respectful, thank them for their time and thoughts, and be genuine if you have further questions. If you harass either of them, you are unworthy to live in the very basements you dwell in. I also wanted to thank Donald Keller for assisting me in designing this debate format. Debaters, let's review this format. I've asked each of you to prepare a two-minute opening statement. Afterwards, you will both be given three sets of three questions. You'll be given two minutes to answer each question, after which point I will softly say, time. You may finish your sentence in thought, but please don't make me use my mute button. You may also yield your time if you feel you do not need the two minutes to answer the question. After the three questions have been answered, your opponent will have 90 seconds to respond. And then we'll get a second of uh, a, a segment of three questions, himself or herself. This will go back and forth until the end, at which point you'll have two minutes to issue a closing statement with which you may answer anything more fully, respond to your opponent's rebuttals, or make a point that you don't feel was adequately covered during this debate. So let's begin. Sarah, please give us your opening statement. The question of abortion is one that comes down to a conflict of rights between a woman and the potential child that she's carrying. Regardless of when you believe life or personhood or whatever measure you're choosing to use, we can all hopefully agree that the issue being discussed regards a loss of potential life. In the libertarian tradition, a person is a free moral agent with sole dominion over his or her own life. This entails the right to make choices believed necessary to a desired emotional or psychological as well as purely physical state. The right to control one's body is meaningless after all without the right to control how the body affects the rest of oneself. To interfere with self-determination, that's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, is to deny the human the capability of moral agency and to treat a person as a thing. When such interference occurs on a systemic basis, we have a word for this. We call it slavery. It includes race slavery, forced labor camps, conscription, and proscription of abortion, which is sometimes known as breeding slavery. And those who believe abortion to be morally wrong tend to focus all their view, all their attention on the fetus or the baby. In, other, in their view, the rights of the woman and the consequences to her life are only secondary to the proposed right of the fetus to life. Libertarians, however, believe in the sanctity of private property as well. And there is no private property that is more private than one's own body. We have to wrestle with the question of whether the right to life is one that is a natural right and a negative one, or if even for a limited period of time, it's a right that entails a positive claim on the body of a woman. And the implications of endorsing life as a positive right for those potential persons who are not yet sufficiently developed in order to be able to sustain life on their own cannot simply swept, be swept under the rug because they have very real impacts on the world as it already exists. A huge number of potential lives are often left out of this debate if we do endorse the belief that all human life must be given a chance to grow okay. to the point where it's capable of surviving outside of a womb. There are over a million embryos in long-term cryogenic storage in the U.S. What rights to life do they have? Whose body do they have a claim to because of those rights? And does this right to life exist only as a positive claim until birth? And if preserving life is the real issue, those are the issues we should be grappling with. Okay, thank you. Dennis, please give us your opening statement. Well, whatever we look into embryology, human life begins at conception when the male sperm connects with the female ovium and ends up with a, fuse, a fusion and actually a spark of life just recently recorded um, in 2016. Now, the question here is not whether this is a life or whether this is human. The real question here is, is this a person? Because there's a massive difference between simply human life 
or personhood. So at what point do we decide to grant personhood to this? Now, we can look back into the past history of the United States at the Dred Scott decision, where the decision of personhood was left up arbitrarily to another human being. And I don't believe that that's a path that we need to go down ever again. So whenever you're thinking about this debate, I believe that my opponent here will agree that this is a unique life with its own individual DNA. The only moral issue in this debate or legal issue in this debate is whether we are to grant this life personhood. I say yes because whenever we draw a moral distinction in what humans we decide to grant personhood to or not, it's always morally reprehensible and history will look back on us in fear. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, we're gonna start with you. These first three questions are from me. <clears throat> Question one, Ben Shapiro makes the following argument. A first trimester fetus has moral value because whether you consider it a potential human life or a full, or a full on human life, it has more value than just a cluster of cells. If left to its natural processes, it will grow into a baby. So the real question is, where do you draw the line? So you're going to draw the line, the heartbeat. There are people who are adults who are alive because of a pacemaker. They need some sort of outside force generating the heartbeat. Are you going to do it based on brain function? Okay, well, what about people who are in a coma? Should we just kill them? End quote. How would you respond? I would base it on the ability to sustain your life without requiring the claim on resources of another. And, and that really becomes an issue of technology. It would be great if we had artificial wombs and the technology necessary to facilitate fetal transfer, but unfortunately we don't. So to me, the solution to that technological loss is not you know, to force a woman to act as a gestational carrier against her will. It's to try and find a technological solution. We wouldn't say that someone has the ability to, if they need to be on a respirator, oh, well, we don't have automatic respirators yet, so it's okay for you to force your grandson to be by your side 24 seven to act as your personal respirator to sustain your life. Okay. Uh, again, two minutes to answer this question. <clears throat> Documents, video and audio sources have revealed many issues with accidental births during an abortion from gruesome pictures depict depicting nauseating scenes to live births with fetuses, crying, screaming and seizing to confessions of inter intentional birthing and subsequent suffocation. The numbers of, of, of such events are now in the thousands, documented. These are not in back alley black market situations. These are tales from Planned Parenthood, fully functional and widely trusted hospitals, and leaked from reputable doctors. Pro-choice advocates often argue that illegalizing abortion would result in increasing brutality. But having been witness to such events myself in person, it is difficult to imagine. How would you defend the practice knowing that these such events have taken place, letting it continue to be legal? Well, my primary argument would be that making it illegal doesn't prevent these practices from continuing to take place. Um, that's one of the problems that we face is that this is a social issue that we're trying to solve with an initiation of government force. And what does that look like? It looks like forcing women to give birth against their will. Uh, in cases of late, um, in cases of very late term, pregnancy, I think the issue that really needs to be looked at is the viability of the child itself. And that improves again with technology. Uh, but when you're looking at that viability, you have to look at it as, as a whole um, concept. One thing that has come up a lot recently is the idea of late term abortions or, you know, third trimester abortions where in developed countries, there is very much arguably um, an ability for that child to survive independently. But the cases that are actually being presented with this issue of should abortion be allowed are not necessarily cases in which um, a woman just does not want to be uh, a, a practicing mother or, you know, a, a doesn't want to raise the child. It is an issue of um, that there are very difficult medical conditions. And if we're talking about um, minimizing suffering, then is it better or worse to force a mother to birth a child and then watch them just slowly die? You know, I don't, I don't necessarily think there's any solutions to this that come out with everything being rosy, but um, if we're going to try and minimize force, we also want to make it easier for the alternatives to not be so scary. We need to make, abor make abortion, yes, is an option, but 
if adoption is a, an easier option and the time that in physical resources that you have to commit to a pregnancy before you can remove it without killing your infant at that point, we should be able to do that and we should make uh, uh, adoption much more easily accessible and not such a, I mean, the system that we have is not one that most parents would want to put their kids into. Would you rather put them into a situation where they might suffer for the rest of their life or let them die? That actually leads perfectly into my next question. If many and most pro-choice movement in the pro-choice movement believe that having an abortion should be rare, aren't we essentially admitting that it is unethical as there's no ethical dilemma with doing too much of a good or acceptable behavior? And if we accept that the procedure is unethical, aren't we quietly confessing that a life has been destroyed? Absolutely. And I don't think it's something that anybody should take lightly. I'm not going to argue that there are not people who take it lightly. But there are also people who take murder lightly. Um, Not saying that that is, you know, indicative of a moral good that there are people who exist who take this very serious subject lightly. Um, When we're talking about just that, the destruction of life, if we are going to make it uh, an issue of, of a positive claim, we really, like I said, we have to address the lives on the other side of that line of are you already within a woman who you could potentially make a claim on. I think we have to consider that, that issue, you know, holistically. Okay, sure. Uh, Dennis, you have 90 seconds to respond to uh, issue a rebuttal for anything she said. Okay. I was just wondering about the issue there that you covered about viability. Um, Where? Because whenever we're talking about somewhere like New York, the viability is going to be at 21 weeks. But if we're in Northern Montana, the viability is going to be at 35 weeks. Mm -hmm. If I were to take a pregnant woman from New York, that's 22 weeks along and move her to Northern Montana. Does that life have any less value for that geographical switch? Absolutely not. And I think, I think one of the things we've agreed on is that all of these lives do have value and that the loss of any of them is very tragic and is something that we're trying to minimize. Um, the issue there is, again, access to technology. Is, that is tragic that depending on where you are, even within the same country, um, the ability of you to give you know, a chance at life to a child is limited based on you know, what do you have available? Where's your local hospital? Um, what resources do they have? You know, other countries deal with the same thing, but that is also why this is a question that when we're talking about laws, we're looking at it legally and not morally. It, morally, it is always a tragedy, but legally, when are we okay forcing a woman to act as a carrier against her will? We, we can't hear Sorry, you. we're still on your time, Dennis. Did you want to follow that up with anything? That's fine. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Dennis, these questions are now for you and from me. <clears throat> First question, there's no scientific consensus on when life begins. The chromosomes begin to grow immediately, but DNA takes time to develop. After that, brain, hearts, fingers, and other parts grow at various times. When is it a life and without scientific bank- backing, how are you not forcing your morality onto someone else? Well, I'm someone who believes it's a uh, life at conception and implantation implantation. Um, And I believe embryology has actually been very clear on this, that as the fertilization happens, it becomes a life from the male's germination of the ovium and has its own unique DNA. It is a living potential human being. So uh, I believe the, the science is pretty subtle whenever it comes to embryology. Okay. Uh, Second question. Pro-life advocates treat the life of an unborn fetus as a life, but they are often put, but they often put the mother in a situation that no other human would be permitted to put her in. If she is raped and has lost the autonomy of her body, do we then task her with a further burden of birthing a life she had no consent to create and invade her personal privacy in order to make sure she does so? And if the pregnancy threatens to kill her, do we tell her she must die so that this potential life might occur? Well, that's a bit of two questions there. First off, whenever it comes to rape, I'm a strong advocate for we should hunt that man down, castrate him or kill him. But that does not justify another immoral action, another bad thing to happen 
of determination of the life that's with inside her. I will not ever force a woman to carry a baby to term. The rapist did so. Um, what was the second part of that? The, the second question, no, uh, is, uh, is if the pregnancy threatens her life. Okay, if the pregnancy threatens her life and she has to do something medically to save her own life, then you're not in turn actually killing the baby. You are passively killing the baby in an attempt to save the mother. That would be, for an instance, in an ectopic pregnancy, that's a very viable thing, but the embryo doesn't have a chance of survival anyways. Okay, uh, third question. <clears throat> if we treat the fetus as a life and terminating it as equal to murder, then isn't injuring the life the same as assault? Is smoking, drinking, or eating unhealthy foods during pregnancy then criminal? Since there's an elevated of ri risk of damage in a car accident, should we then forbid pregnant people to drive? We want to know who gets to decide what risk is too great and how much risk is advisable or inadvisable. Well, I don't believe going out with risk is something that we need to assess. I believe we're all kind of liberty minded or libertarians here. And we believe that you can assess your own risk and the risk of your child. I mean, most of us probably stand against laws that don't let our children walk down the street without us, you know, laws like what we have up north that do not allow you to let your children play outside unsupervised. So we all accept the risk as parents of whatever we deem necessary. And I think that's part of it. But there are also laws that prevent me from killing my four-year-old. <laughs> it's a little different issue of whether I want to let my child go out and assume some risk or whether I want to destroy its life. That's a totally different issue. Okay. Uh, Sarah, you have 90, 90 seconds to issue a rebuttal. Okay. I have two questions. First to the, the first question that you asked where you, you uh, talked about when life begins. I noticed that you specifically said that you, you, you said that you begin, believe that life begins at conception, but then at one point you added in conception and implantation. Um, why do you, um, wh why do you make that differentiation and why is that life, which is a human life, whether inside or outside of, of a body, why is it afforded more rights um, to the point where it can make a claim on the body of someone else only after well, implanting? Well, with modern technology, we can all tell that fertility clinics, by and large, fertilize the eggs and turn them into a viable zio. Um, however, without implantation, there's no natural processes. You can leave that implanted egg alone for all of eternity and it will never mature to a human being but whenever implantation happens then the natural processes take place and without interruption or some tragedy that will become a full-fledged human being so you don't believe that they have the same rights to life outside of the body only it only once they are a potential life that um, has a claim on the resources of the woman I believe whenever left alone to the natural processes that it can become a human life. It does have the protection or should have the protection of personhood. So outside of that natural process happening, no, we can't justify saying that a embryo that's been implanted in a lab is viable life until it gets implanted into a female. Okay. The the sec do I have can I have, do I have Sarah we're still yeah I'm giving you full ninety seconds I'm not counting okay. time. Um, then the second question I have uh, is in reference to you're discussing the a bit that it's okay for a woman to um, to have an abortion if it is for the safety of her own life, uh, and you made a differentiation between killing and uh, letting die. Yes. Why do you make that differentiation only when a woman has um, a, a th okay, I guess this question is more of, a, it is a question of risk tolerance because any time that a woman is choosing to carry a gestation, carry a pregnancy, there is inherent risk involved in that. The amount of risk varies between okay. women depending on you know, your body, your, your physical status, making how risky that is. is. Um, where do you draw the line then where it's acceptable for a woman to remove a pregnancy, which 
in any case will result in the death. It will let die. Um, you don't have to kill. And in fact, in most early term abortions, you don't Time. kill, but you in fact let die uh, a fetus simply by removing it from, from a womb. Go ahead, Dennis. Well, whenever it comes to those early term abortions, those are directly to kill the fetus. Whenever it comes to something like, for instance, if the mother had breast cancer and she were to go through chemotherapy, that is saving the woman's life. And in part, the child will most likely die from this. And I believe looking at the value of saving a life and passively the other life dies. So, so let me... So okay. in the case, I just want to say, in, the, in that case, you, the example you use is a woman who has is cancer. Or do you believe that the woman should still have to carry her pregnancy while receiving treatment, even though the treatment would most likely kill the infant? Or do you think it, do you believe it is acceptable for her to have an abortion, which by definition doesn't necessarily kill the infant, it removes a pregnancy, um, which the result of which is, if done so before um, viability, it, it results in the death of the infant. Uh, late, some later term where there's like the, it's, um, uh, there are later term abortions that do involve intentional killing because there are like an injecting um, into the heart. But when you're dealing with early term abortions, you're actually removing the placenta and the pregnancy itself as a whole. All right. Go ahead, Dennis. You respond, then we will move on. Okay. So whenever it comes to that, what you're talking about, all abortions end in the termination of a fetus, the termination of a life. That yeah. is pretty much the definition of that. If you're talking about ending the pregnancy, a cesarean ends the pregnancy. Um, no early term abortions except for egg topic are actually performed due to health risks to the mother for the most part. You know, we can talk about the extreme examples where they are, but- What about gestational diabetes? Tara. Gestational diabetes can be handled through nutritional patterns. Okay. I work with jo Dr. Joel Wallach. We got we to gotta move on. You may, you may address any of this in your closing statements or future rebuttals if you'd like. This is the set of questions that goes to the We're Libertarians, from the We're Libertarians audience. Um, and we're going to start with the questions for you, Sarah. Uh, why is it when scientists discover a microorganism swimming under ice on Mars, we say, we discovered life on Mars? But somehow something the size of an apple that could develop into personhood inside of a human or inside of a human isn't considered life. I mean, I think we've already addressed that and that I do consider it life. It is life. And in fact, I think it's arguably a person. Um, I think that extends further back than most people will give an accounting for. Um, and I think that's why we even have this debate in the first place. That's uh it's probably true. <laughs> All right. Uh, number two, if a surrogate decides she wants her, ch wants her choice and kills someone else's baby, how is that not murder? In that case, it is, it is a tragedy, but it is, it is something that is included in surrogacy contracts that a woman, because she is choosing to contract um, a service for someone else, she still does not give up the overall rights to her body. Is it a terrible thing to do? Absolutely. I mean, as somebody who's dealing with fertility markets myself, if, if, that happened to me that somebody who was a surrogate chose to have an abortion of my baby. Like that is a tragic, horrible thing and has many consequences, but her signing that contract no, doesn't make her my slave. And we don't allow human slavery. And I think that's what it comes down to is, do I have a right to her body because she signed a contract or does she have signed a contract to help me with something? And she still maintains a right to her body and can break that contract because of it. All right. Um, third question, is a baby after birth a viable life? If not, at what point does it become a viable life? 24 hours, a week, month, year, five years old. Some of those can't sustain life on their own with outside assistance. If it is a viable life just moments after birth, is it a viable life 12 hours before? A week before, a month before, six months, conception? There are pre-birth fetuses that are viable and children that are born that need extensive medical care in order to even become viable. So the line is blurred on viability. Where is and what defines a viable life? When does an abortion violate the non-aggression principle? Um, I th well, I think those are, those are two very kind of disjointed questions, but the, to, for when... Um... <laughs> For when what viability is there, that is a, a defined term that deter based, is based on uh, the availability of technology. And like you said, it is it's a sliding scale and it's a gray term because 
viability is also never guaranteed. It's, it's a state of, could we potentially um, uh, save this, this life? You know, not all uh, infants are viable, even if they are carried to full term. And that is, that is a human tragedy. Um, as far as it, uh, violating the non-aggression principle, um, I, I guess I, I, that's, that's, that's like a whole separate question in and of itself. Uh, that comes down to, I think if you were going to consider uh, questions of like self-defense, I think you can justify that pretty easily under uh, the requirements of what it's demanding for a woman's body. Um, I think just because you are able to justify something under non-aggression though, doesn't mean that you should do it. Uh, and you should still try and minimize the amount of force used on other people at any time. Okay. Uh, Dennis, 90 seconds to issue a rebuttal. I don't really have anything to rebut on that. I think that was a pretty good answer. Um, <laughs> Sounds like Sarah would be willing to take your time for you. <laughs> Just, you want to talk to me? No, you're we all right. We actually get through this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, the We're Libertarians audience have the following three questions for you, Dennis. We have the ability to detect if a child has certain debilitating defects before they're even born. Even aside from mental handicaps and disorders, we know fairly early on uh, if the child is going to live in agonizing pain and die within the first year of their life. Furthermore, we know sustaining this life could place the family in hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and use up valuable resources for lives that actually are sustainable. Is this life worth that anguish caused to the family and to the child itself? Is it worth the mother going bankrupt for? Well, I think that the complications with life, whenever we're talking about something like this, I mean, do we really want to become eugenicists? Um, you're talking about any type of handicap, mental handicap, disability, anything like that. What would happen if Stephen Hawking's mother would have discovered this? I think a world of physics and the whole world around us would be a little bit different. And currently, you know, one of the primary attacks on uh, this eugenicist process is people with Down syndrome, but there's recent studies right now showing Down syndrome could actually cure some of the aging deformities that we have. So I think we need to be very, very careful when we start moving into the world of eugenics. Second question. Governments have notoriously abused their powers. They have attempted to sterilize minorities by mandating medical practices that would render them infertile. You already brought up eugenics. The idea then is that a government having the power to ban abortion is by default a government powerful enough to mandate one uh, or mandate other things to your body. Is giving the government control over this area not dangerous considering their illustrious history of untrustworthiness? Well, obviously giving the government control over anything is dangerous. I mean, it's government. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> However, whenever it comes to this issue, I believe one of the only reasons government has a moral existence is to protect those who can't be protected. Uh, whenever it comes to our federal government, one of its only reasons for existing is protecting our shores from invasion and protecting us like that. I believe that living in a civilized society, one of the most moral reasons we have is that we do not go into mob mentality Instead, we let the government have a uh, can't remember the word. Uh, we we let the government take the issue of control over our laws instead of going out as a mob and enforcing what we believe to be right. So, whenever it comes to an issue like this, like the preservation of life. I believe that government is the only entity that has the moral authority to do so because it will not be mob mentality. Great. Uh, last question from the Weird Libertarians audience to you. When posed with the dilemma of saving a young child versus saving a thousand viable embryos, most people, even pro-life people, respond that they would save the young child. This indicates that we naturally see an inherent difference in what we value in moral terms. Regardless of whether you would rescue the embry embryos or the child yourself, how would you reconcile that disparity? Well, I mean, this is the trolley car question, truly. Um, you know, standard trolley car question. I'm standing here at an intersection, and uh, Sarah's on uh, track A, 
which the train is going down and five other people are on track B. Um, do I pull the switch, killing the five other people and saving Sarah, or do I not pull the switch? You know, and I, that right there is, uh, do I passively let people die or do I actively interject and kill another? Um, and it's, it's not really the greatest issue. And we can break it down another way like this, you know, you have, you're in a fertility clinic, you have two viable embryos that are yours, you know they will implant and they will bring your baby to life. Or you have the other room with a hundred screaming adults you could say, which one do you do? These are moral intuitions, but that doesn't actually justify which one is morally correct, okay? It's just moral intuitions. And like we said earlier, where I talked about the life of the mother if she had cancer versus the life of the child, it's obvious that anyone has a moral cognition to believe that the life of a living human being that's already living, breathing, fully viable is a little bit better, but that's a, that's just a moral intuition. It not a justification. Okay. Sarah, you have 90 seconds to respond. Um, just, I mean, I don't have, I have too much of a response other than that. Um, you know, you acknowledge that there is a, a difference and that there is a, you know, in this conflict of rights, there is at least some intuition towards preferencing the woman. Um, but I guess, how do you just, how do you, um, how do you rectify and justify the line drawn towards where, what are you comfortable, um, f what are you comfortable, you know, enforcing on a woman as opposed to what is her right to choose? You know, it, is it, it, pregnancy and gestation, even if, if just done once and you give the baby up for adoption, that is a huge risk that any woman is taking on and it involves permanent physical changes um, that carry with you for the rest of your life. Why is that, um, why is that not equally valid? Can you clarify that a little bit? Um, so in your, you're talking about the, the, the cancer and that the woman, you know, you said there is a, a intuition that the woman's life, that a, a woman, you know, an existing life as opposed to a potential life um, has some more value. How do you justify the amount of, um, the amount uh, that that right is reduced to make it justifiable just because it's, it's a change that, I guess, I, I guess it is a change that um, is acceptable? Well, like I said, it's not a justifiable position. What it is is moral intuition. We have those all the time. I mean, at what point, uh, at what point do you justify any moral intuitions that you truly have? It's just, it, it, it's not justifiable one way or the other. I mean, we can go into a sci-fi situation where it's uh, a woman here and myself on a starship and there's no human beings beside me or her and there's 5,000 viable embryos that can be implanted into artificial wombs and make it to gestation and grow up to be adults, who do I save? Well, you know, every sci-fi movie ever says it's the embryos. I did not count the uh, clarification against you, Sarah, so you still have 30 seconds if you'd like it. Uh, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I, I hope we can get to the technology, though. That's in my questions. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Sarah... These are Dennis's three questions for you. Okay. You support a woman's right to make her own reproductive choices in regards to abortion and contraception. Are there any restrictions you would approve of? Um, I, would all, I would say all reproductive uh, choices in cases where there is not an, ab an ability to give the child a chance at life outside of the womb. So my big thing is viability. Um, I think that you is as long as there is a child who has a chance at life and sometimes there are cases of children who have uh, conditions that, have, that are, they are considered incompatible with life which means yes you may have a live birth but your child will, will have a slow and often painful death um, living maybe you know sometimes it's a couple of days sometimes it's up to a year I know and that's never a, a good circumstance but if the child is able to rely on technology and potentially be able to survive on their own, I do think that that's something that we should do. Okay. Uh, second question. If you do not believe that life begins at conception, 
when do you believe it begins? Or we should say human life begins at conception. When does it begin? At what stage of development should an unborn child have human rights? Uh, I do believe life begins at conception. Um, I believe that conception is a process. It's not a moment. A lot of people want to think of it, like you said, like that spark, but that um, moment of fertilization, if, is that the spark that we're going to consider or is it the moment of implantation, like you had mentioned? Um, all of that is in the process of conception and uh, what you're conceiving of is a pregnancy and a pregnancy is a potential life. I think that once that potential life can sustain life um, independently, Yes, we all have resources and needs. You know, we, we can't all sustain life independently if we don't have access to food and infants are no different. They have different levels of um, need for help, but so do different adults. Uh, I think that if melding that in kind of muddies the issue that what you're, you're talking about here is not just a claim to some anonymous other persons uh, helping you to survive. It is a specific person you're making a claim over their physical being. Okay. Um, third question. So taking rape and incest scenarios just out of the equation, under what circumstances would you encourage your sister or daughter or best friend to get an abortion? Uh, I wouldn't. I would offer to take the baby personally. Okay. Dennis, uh, 90 seconds to issue a rebuttal. Well, um, whenever it comes to this, you're talking about uh, viability being kind of your offset there. Um, and you're talking about like when the child's born, someone else can take care of it. Uh, if a mother does decide to bring the child to full term or has it at 21 weeks and the baby is allowed to live and she takes it home, at what point does she, is she allowed to uh, negate that responsibility and pass it on to someone else? Or is she actually liable for feeding and taking care of that child because she took on that burden? Uh, well, I think that falls not under a, an abortion debate, but under just parenting laws. And the way that we've dealt with that is that, yes, as long as you've taken on the responsibility of parenting this child, you always have the option of giving that responsibility up. We have an entire state system, which is not great. It's not a wonderful system. I wouldn't want to put my kids into it, but it is a system that we have set up to ensure that you can't just, um, if you do not feed your child and you do not pass them off to another entity, that's neglect. Those, that, we have that under different laws already. Dennis, you still have 45 seconds if you want it. No, that's fine. We are efficient. You really are. You really are. I, I, I was amazed that you were both willing to let each other answers during the rebuttals. I got to be honest with you, I was much more ruthless during my debates. You only had to sniff I, at me once. I was like 90 seconds and it's going to be all me. You, you, you were both, you've both been real. Uh, let's get through these without a fight and then I'll sing your praises. Uh, <laughs> Dennis, these are serious three questions for you. How would you enforce a ban on abortion without stripping women of their privacy rights? Well, first off, I believe the privacy rights in Roe v. Way is what we're going to go into. And uh, I think that was kind of a terrible decision whenever it comes to that, because that actually leaned on the 14th Amendment instead of the 4th Amendment if it was actually a privacy issue. Um, however, whenever it comes down to it, any medical procedure that we look into actually strips you of your privacy rights. If I were to go in to a psychiatrist and say that I am personally thinking about going and shooting up this school, then I would be called onto that and my doctor would actually have a legal obligation to report me to proper authorities. That's not really a violation of my Fourth Amendment rights or my due process rights for some weird reason. The 14th Amendment, like Roe v. Wade, what that is, is actively preventing my attempt to end life. All right, second question. What rights do you afford to the more than a million embryos in frozen storage in the US alone? Well, like I said, those are embryos that cannot be put through natural processes on their own uh, when left alone. There is absolutely no way that those can turn into a human life. Thus, for there's 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 nothing we can really do about that. And you know, thank goodness for some of that research because without it, fertility would continue going down. I've got several members of my family who've dealt with that. In fact, my sister-in-law carried twins um, for someone else through in vitro fertilization. Um, 
and I think it's a pretty amazing thing. But from the point that those were human life sitting in a jar, um, several of them probably got discarded. They tried to implant, and most of them that got implanted did not take, which is the common thing, just like whenever an embryo gets made through the uh, natural processes, most of them actually do not attach. So if we were to say that other than attachment, you know, just the conception alone without the natural processes going through that, then what are we going to accuse every woman out there who's hasn't had a egg attached whenever it got conceived a murderer? I, I disagree with that premise. Okay. If technology were made available, which allowed a woman to transfer a pregnancy to an artificial womb, but doing so would involve a risk of the fetus dying in the process, essentially being aborted, would that be an acceptable alternative? Oh, I'm a big fan of the technology. In fact, we've done this on sheep and goats in the past, and I hope that it continues advancing so that way this becomes a non-issue in the future. I mean, isn't that what we always pray for? You know, back in the 1930s, uh, you know, the childhood mortality rate was through the roof, technology advanced. Now we even have points where we can get a child out at 21 weeks and it's viable and let it survive. So I think that that is by far the best way we could go about this is supporting that technology. In fact, I uh, hope to propose some, uh, some bills to some friends of mine in Congress to try to move away the blockades that are in the way of this technological advancements. We should work yeah. together. On that. I was going to say you and Sarah have <laughs> uh, knowing, knowing you both, I, I get together on that issue. Uh, Sarah, you have 90 seconds to issue a rebuttal. Um, so to the, to the first question, you are talking about that what, um, it wouldn't be necessary to strip a woman of her privacy rights because you could just go in through, I guess, some sort of basically regulating, um, making doctors mandatory reporters for um, cases of abortion, which does involve uh, invading a woman's privacy rights. If we are to consider medical uh, rights to be privacy rights, like you can actually go into your psychiatrist and because they're your psychiatrist, you can tell them I am thinking about doing this horrible, terrible thing. And they're not a mandated reporter in that case because their job is to be the person that you can tell that you're thinking these terrible, horrible things to, and they can give you the necessary treatment in order to not have that happen. The same is true of, of doctors. You know, we have a system that is supposed to be based on the relationship between a doctor and a patient is just that. It's medical. It's that they can make the best medical decisions for the patient. But what you're introducing is the idea that we should make doctors mandatory reporters that if a woman wants to come to you to remove a pregnancy, that you should report her as a potential, um, a potential murderer, in which case that goes back to my original question. What do you do with her at that point? How are you going to enforce that you're not allowed to remove this pregnancy? And more than that, what about the women who aren't going to need to go to the doctor? Because you can have an abortion by yourself in your own home if done early enough. Okay. So whenever it comes down to that, um, the doctor would not be reporting you like you were talking about in the psychologist instant. I'm thinking about blowing up this school and I'm going to blow up this school or two different instances. If I say, hey, I'm going to blow up this school, my doctor is actually under legal, legal obligation to report that to the authorities. There's a big difference there. Now, whenever it comes down to it, I believe the woman actually, in most cases, since you know, 1973 is when Roe versus Wade passed. Most women do not have the mens rea to say that's murder. And I would never advocate for women to be arrested for murder for this. It's the doctors that actually take on the punishment whenever it comes to this loss of medical license, jail time, any of that, because they actually do have the mens rea and know that it's a human life. So how, but how would you enforce it on the women themselves? So if a woman doesn't need a doctor, if you're able to get access to a, to a medication or chemical that allows you to have an abortion within your own home, how are you going to enforce the idea that, no, you're not allowed to do that? You have to, what are you going to do that's going to make that woman carry that baby to term? Dennis, go there's ahead and answer nothing. that, and, and then we will do uh, closing statements. But you can go ahead and answer that, Dennis. There, there's absolutely nothing you can do in that instance. What you're looking at is... Um, hey, 
a buddy of mine wants to go shoot up uh, some heroin, uh, should I automatically make dosing centers for heroin legal for that or not? I'm <laughs> libertarian, of course. <laughs> but yes. uh, minimize the harm necessary if they're going to do something like that. Don't and, act yeah. government force. Yes. Well, I believe that's not minimizing harm because you're talking about an average before Roe v. Way of around 50,000 attempted abortions a year to where now you have over a million a year. I mean, that's a massive difference. There's what going to be the outlier case. Do what? What about the deaths of the women involved? Are there more or less deaths uh, associated with women who seek out abortion? The point being that if they're going to seek it out, you don't necessarily need to go through a doctor. You, if you can't enforce that, then what is the point of having that law other than to have a way to invade privacy? The point of enforcing that law is to stop doctors from doing so. You're going to stop the majority of cases. You're not going to have over a million a year. And whenever you talk about the privacy or the rights of the woman, you're talking about 500,000 a year that die every year due to abortion. And more of them die due to childbirth. More than 500,000 yes. women die a year in the U.S. due to childbirth. Yeah. Oh, yes, in the U.S., childbirth is significantly more dangerous than abortion. That sounds okay. like a good place. Uh, I mean, we may agree to disagree on the statistics, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and do our closing statements. Uh, Sarah, two minutes to uh, deliver a closing statement. The real issue is the right to self-determination. The woman has a prior moral claim because she is the already existing free moral agent. It's her life, her body, and her physical resources that are being claimed, not the other way around. A woman's right to self-determination includes not only the right to control her physical body and all that happens within it, but the psychological and existential components of her life and her well-being as well. In the case of an unwanted pregnancy, the existential choice for a woman is not between abortion or no abortion. It is between abortion and compulsory childbearing. This brings into play the libertarian principle of limited government. If the government can force a pregnant woman to be a mother, and she is the biological mother even if she does not raise the child, then she is coerced into putting her body at the disposal of the fetus as if she were an unclaimed resource or a chattel slave. And even if the fetus is removed and raised separately, she is still forced to be a manufacturer, a baby machine, if you will. <laughs> Thus, a woman's most fundamental right of choice and the right to control her own body is destroyed. Finally, ultimately, it seems like we can truly come together over the idea of technology being the ultimate solution to this. But if we are to allow technology to be researched, then in order to do that, we also have to allow abortion as a medical procedure to continue to be an available option to those who would seek it out. Because researching the potential of being able to keep a child alive outside of a woman is always going to involve allowing a woman to remove it. Okay, and uh, Dennis, you have two minutes to issue your closing statement. I think when it comes down to this, we are totally in agreement that we hope for and want to strive for this technology to advance. But until the point it advances, that is not the woman's body. That is a unique body. Otherwise, you're saying that every pregnant woman out there has at least four feet, four hands, two hearts, and two brains. <laughs> That's a pretty absurd statement right there. I had to kind of put it out there. But whenever it comes down to it, you're talking about forcing a woman to carry the baby. No, nobody's forcing you to carry the baby unless it was a case of rape. All we're doing is preventing the legal medical procedure currently and outlawing it so that way a medical doctor cannot go in and forcibly kill this human being. Okay, so that's the debate, guys. I just wanted to thank you both so much. I, I honestly could not have expected us in the closing statements for you to say something like, oh, we agree with each other. That's is unbelievable on something, <laughs> on something like abortion is just <laughs> unbelievable. And so I could not have asked for two better debaters than you two. I really, um, uh, it's, it's, I can't, it's hard to say at the end, I highly recommend the episode, but I absolutely will. Uh, if somebody wants to learn how to debate intelligently without making personal arguments and being willing to come to an understanding. Dennis, Sarah, you both come highly recommended. So I just really appreciate it from you two. I want to uh, know, neither one of us went religious. Yeah, I that's... Really 
Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would have been the guy to do it too. It, uh, it was difficult. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you both for your time and your ideas on the difficult subject. Once again, I'd like to thank our audience for their respect for both of you folks for confronting very difficult questions and lending your time and your minds to this conversation. Uh, I appreciate everyone who tuned in. Debaters, keep fueling the fires of liberty. <laughs>